Welcome to Self Discovery Media Network, formerly known as Self Discovery Radio. Each week, we bring you illuminating shows from those making a difference in the lives of others. They've taken their own journey. They're here to share their skills, their wisdom to help you on yours. You can see more about us at selfdiscoverymedia.com, and please listen to our wonderful collection of shows. Our next show is all right. So welcome to Transformations, interviewing people who are changing our world. And I'm your host, Diane J. Shaver, coach to entrepreneurs who have heart as well as focus on the bottom line. And each week I interview someone who's doing something to make this a better world for everyone. And as you've noticed, each person is very different from the other. But what they have in common is dedication, commitment, courage, and strength and a desire to do something to make this a better world for everyone. And my wish is that they inspire you to add whatever it is that you have that you can do to make this better for everyone. And today, my guest is Ian Thompson, who's founder of Ocean Crusaders, and will you please, world record holder for fastest solo circumnavigation of Australia and a monohull. This is pretty impressive. So let me read a little bit from the Ocean Crusaders website so you get a feel for what they're doing. Ocean Crusaders is a charity organization that specializes in waterway cleaning on a large scale. The entire campaign is run with a passion for the ocean, having seen the issue our wildlife is facing firsthand. Looking into the eyes of a dead turtle and wondering what killed it, to later find out that it was plastics, drives this campaign to ensure that our oceans, waterways, and beaches are clean and safe for all animals. We operate a social enterprise that sees us working for government organizations and large corporations to clean waterways on a regular basis with our core crew. So that's a little bit of background. And now welcome Ian Thompson, Ocean Crusaders. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, good morning. Good morning. Oh, or actually, it's 6 p.m. here, so um, good morning to you. Hi. <laughs> so what made you decide to create Ocean Crusaders? I know what you said about the sea turtle, but it takes a lot to put an organization together, so there must have been many things that worked together to do this. So what was it for you? It, it literally came down, and, and I know it sounds strange, but it was the turtles. Um, eight dead turtles as a skipper in the wet Sundays. I mean, I absolutely love the ocean. Uh, diving through the waterways, swimming with these turtles, the sharks, seeing the reef. Um, but then in my time up in the wet Sundays on the Great Barrier Reef, like to be pulling dead turtles out, um, yeah. you know, it, it's not fun. And, and one in particular, like the we pulled out, there was four of us pulling it out of the water because it was such a big turtle. And I was at the front and I caught its eye. <clears throat> Pardon me. And um, there was a moment where it was trying to tell me something and I didn't know what it was. So as I say, looking into the eyes of a dead turtle and wondering, you know, what it was that killed it. And so that one in particular, I said, we need to know what killed it. It's trying to tell me something. And finding a plastic bag in its stomach full of cigarette butts, like there's 12 cigarette butts, half a Coke can and a water bottle cap in its guts. Oh. Look, I used to use plastic bottles. I used to use plastic bags. Mm -hmm. Then seeing the issue of what our laziness has causing to our wildlife that we want to all enjoy, yeah. that was, I, I needed to do something. Yeah. I wasn't a scientist. Um, I didn't know how to research this stuff, so I decided, well, I'll do something that I'm good at, which was sailing. <clears throat> but I was actually watching um, Waterworld, which is um, Kevin Costner, I think it is, um, and, you know, watching him sail around like on this monster trimaran by himself, and yeah. I thought I could do that. And so I, I found out who, you know, if anyone had sailed around Australia, and, and someone had, um, but... It looked like an achievable record. And so I set off to <laughs> sail around Australia and break the world record and create a profile, which would then give me the opportunity to go and talk to people yeah. um, about what I had seen and start, you know, telling people that, hey, these plastic bags back then was the issue. Um, they're a big issue and they're, they're killing our turtles, our wildlife, our dolphins, our whales. 
And so off I went and, and created that uh, world record. Oh, that's so wonderful. I, I want to say two things. I come from Newport, Rhode Island, which is a sailing community. We've done the America's Cup mm. before, before you all got it. But anyway, and um, here we have loggerhead turtles that are very precious to all of us. So that when you talk about the turtles, it really strikes <clears throat> home. It will strike home with people here because it's, we try to protect them as much as possible. So, but you talked about that corporations are helping clean up. Tell me about that. That just boggles my mind. I think it's so wonderful to hear those words. Look, um, obviously any charity needs funding. Um, and we've created our reputation as Australia's waterway cleaning team. Um, we do things that a lot of other groups don't. Cleaning the beaches is a fantastic program and all that, but so many people do that. <coughs> um, we encourage people to do that all day, every day. Um, however, there's a lot of places that our turtles will go, our wildlife will go, yeah. that humans won't. And a surprising how much litter is in those places. Wow. So around here in, um, in the Brisbane area, there's a lot of mangrove systems. And mangroves are particularly good at capturing debris. Yeah, the roots. So the, the, the roots, but it, it allows the debris through, but it won't allow the debris out. So the back of the mangrove line at the high tide is usually littered chronically. Um, we go in, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago in a, in a creek that most people, they know there's a bit of rubbish flowing down the middle. Yeah. We went in and we pulled out two and a half ton of rubbish in just two and a half days. Wow. But when you consider that was majority of polystyrene and plastic bottles, the wow. volume was like extravagant. Like I mean, we're, we're talking it was something around about uh, 18 cubic meters of rubbish um, in two and a half days. But to get it, we're walking through mangrove flats. We're going through the mangroves and up the back, you know, we're, <clears throat> we're taking on the uh, three million mosquitoes and, uh, <laughs> wow. you know, fighting them to get to all this rubbish. But um, we've got to get it out. The mangroves are such a, you know, an important part of our environment and protecting our wildlife. Yeah, so the nice. fact that all this rubbish is in there, we've just got to get it out. So, um, yeah, that's what we focus. And to do that, you know, we run you know, pretty expensive equipment. You yeah. know, we've got uh, big crane trucks. We have seven metre landing barges. Um, these things don't come cheap. And the only way to keep them on the water and on the road is to have corporate sponsorship. Right. And we've been working slowly and because of our reputation, these organisations want to work with us because whether it's through offsetting their own, <laughs> well, we talk about carbon emissions and offsetting them, yeah. Maybe like, you know, their own problems are being offset. So, you know, even the Port of Brisbane, which we worked with recently, you know, we know that shipping does cause, you know, quite a lot of, um, you know, carbon emissions and, and all sorts of things. And they're building a new port here, which, you know, they need to to bring the cruise ships in. And we understand that we've got to live. Yeah. But to make their, you know, environmental um, protection goals, they work with us and, and they fund us so that we can go out and kick those goals for them. And uh, that's what we're trying to work with. But we always need more corporate sponsorship. Uh, of course. But you bring up something really, really important. And that is the mindset of between progress, if you will, and, and profit and sustainability and um, con conservation. So, how do you see those two working together? I mean, you, you said about the cruise ships that we have to have those and so forth, but how are we going to work these two things together? These two kind of disparate points <coughs> together. Oh, look, I think big corporate industry is waking up. Um, plastic pollution, particularly of our oceans is one of the hottest topics in the world today. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing organizations all over the place changing their ways. You know, McDonald's are changing like in 2020, uh, here in Australia, they're not going to have plastic straws anymore. Yeah. Um, which is a huge thing from the straw no more campaign that's been going worldwide. Um, we've just seen recently, you know, the, the trash tag, um, which is seeing people out there cleaning up everywhere. The world's changing very, very rapidly. But it does take these big corporations to go, you know what, there's a better way. Yeah. Um, can we build things out of recycled plastic? Can we 
they, you know, cut our emissions in any way. <clears throat> you know, the Brisbane port um, is, is actually going zero waste by 2020, which yeah. is a huge call for a port um, to be wow. able to go for that goal. Now, whether they achieve it or not, I guess, you know, obviously we all aim for goals. I mean, even sailing around Australia was my goal to go around nonstop, unassisted. Well, I had to stop, but at least I had a go. And, and these are the things like, you know, big corporations are realizing they do need to play their part. Um, and, you know, I mean, <clears throat> we're seeing vehicles are now going like, you know, electric. Um, you know, there's a future of vessels doing the same sort of thing or using hydro energy or, or water to power them. So the, the world's moving um, and it's just step by step. We've got to keep moving forward and uh, let's hope that plastic is going to be an endangered species in the future. Oh God, wouldn't that be fabulous? But it's people like you who are making people wake up and people need to see demonstrating <coughs> sort of things happening. And I think sometimes people fall asleep or they feel so overwhelmed, but that's why I love to interview someone like you who is out there actually doing something, even though the, uh, it's like a little, a little effort toward this huge thing, but eventually it will all catch up. So I think mm -hmm. it's very important. And I think that if people will, do their bit, then corporations will more and more respond and more and more wake up. Are you working with other governments or um, are you, do you see this as being a global kind of effort? Um, look, you know, I, I think everyone's got their place. <clears throat> We've seen Slap Boy and Mike working on the, um, you know, the great Pacific garbage patch. Um, you know, we've seen all these little groups around and we love to work with other groups because, we're really good at removing debris. Um, we work with the uh, Tangaroa Blue Foundation, another group here in Australia. Okay. <clears throat> and um, they have the Australian Marine Debris Initiative database. Um, and this is a database that when you do a cleanup, that you work out what it is you've been picking up. So you do an audit on the rubbish. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Great. By, by doing that, you know, the saying is, if all we ever go and do is pick up rubbish, that's all we're ever going to go and do. We need to know what it is, where it's coming from, so we can work on source reduction plans to stop it in the future. Yeah. And that's why data is key. We can give governments facts to make policy change on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We've had the uh, plastic bag ban come into Australia um, in July last year. Uh, in the lead up to that, all of the data that we were inputting into this database was saying there's plastic bags everywhere. Yeah. Um, we can now prove that their policy change has seen a reduction in plastic bags like over the last nine months. Um, we've seen it out in the waterways. Like we're not finding the old simple grey single use plastic bag anymore. Wow. Um, wow. They've become a rare species. <clears throat> we've had the... Um, what we call a container deposit scheme come in here. <clears throat> so we're getting 10 cents back on our containers. That's come in in Queensland, um, Victoria yeah. don't have it. Um, Western Australia is gonna start taking it up. But here in Queensland, it only came in in November last year. Mm -hmm. The reduction of bottles in the environment has already started to decrease. Oh, so having crazy. facts and figures yeah. to prove that these policies are working that's what governments want and that's what we've got to continue to do yeah. is to provide these people facts. Providing government solutions is the other part and that's what we are. We are a solution to getting the debris out of the waterways. Um, we go places that, well, to be honest, they probably couldn't because of workplace health and safety. Um, <clears throat> you know, climbing through mangrove mud, you know, you know sometimes knee deep, um, you know, going over rocks and over water, like workplace health and safety would have a field day with uh, government organisations because they can be sued. Sure. We're just a charity. We don't have anything other than, you know, our assets. So as we say, or as I like to say, you know, go ahead, sue us, we've got nothing. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, that gives us a little bit more freedom to go and do things. So, yeah, yeah the more council can work with us, the better. 
Wow. This is, this is so <clears throat> wonderful to hear. And then you started Paddle Against Plastics. And has that raised awareness, do you feel? Like I said before, like, um, there's a lot of beach cleanups going on out there. And uh, we're waterway cleaning specialists. Like, so <clears throat> we wanted to create something different for the community. So the Paddle Against Plastic campaign was something, I mean, I loved my stand-up paddling. And so back in 2012, we actually paddled 92 kilometres, um, you know, when, when the sport was fairly new and it was quite a distance at the time. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it, it engages the community in their waterways. And, and what we find is by putting people on a kayak, and especially when you put a, a young child on the front um, with a set of tongs and, and you paddle them, and when you start looking for rubbish, you start seeing it. Yeah. Once you start seeing it, you can't stop seeing it. And it becomes a crazy addiction that you can't have this rubbish in the environment. And so all you want to do is pick it up. Um, so that's what we do like with the community is engage them to go and clean up their own waterways and um, you know it, it's really funny that they come back the kayaks are covered in mud the people are covered in mud but their smiles are huge and yeah. it's a really positive campaign and you know if anyone wants to run a paddle against plastic uh, anywhere touch base with us we're happy to run that sort of campaign anywhere we just give you the ideas it's pretty easy to do Oh, I mean, it, all of that sounds so wonderful. And it brings people back in touch with the earth. We've lost such, I, mean, I don't know Australia very well, I'm sorry. But in the States, we've lost such touch with the earth. With, and you are more in touch with it because of, of sailing and so forth. But those things bring us closer. And the other thing that went through my mind, you talked about young children. Um, in the States, it's the young kids that are out there doing things and making huge changes. So <clears throat> I think uh, enlisting those kids really early is, is key. Yeah, well, absolutely. Like, I mean, the kids in Australia are really proactive. Um, just uh, last Friday, there was a strike for climate action from all school students. Yeah, they were here too. We're in the in the. Yeah, they did it there. So, you know, it's fantastic hearing that, that the kids are just going, you know what, you politicians haven't got the idea. This is our future you're messing with. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, yeah, look, to see the power of children and, like, we've got an online education program that goes all over the world um, all the time and we have this theory with that or I have this vision of like a child who sees these images of a turtle dying because of like you know a plastic bag and then going to the shops and tugging on mum and dad's legs saying don't use plastic bags they kill turtles um and if you can say no to a child who's doing that well you know I don't know what sort of parent you are <laughs> maybe you yeah. shouldn't be but I'm not a parent myself so um yeah, it's hard one of those things but um you know, we're about to, uh, next week, we're heading to Fiji. <clears throat> Fiji, they're not a third world country per se, but um, they're getting close. Um, and the plastic issue out in the island is horrific. Um, yeah. You know, my turtle that around my neck here is from Fiji. They're a symbol of long life over there, and it was given to me by a chief of one of the villages. <clears throat> 13 years later, I went back to that village. The whole beach was covered in plastic. Wow. Um, you know, unfortunately, they were selling, you know, products made in China rather than handcrafted products. Um, so, you know, you say losing touch with things. Well, we yeah. are. But And one thing that I think that's done that is actually mobile phones, funny enough. Um, <clears throat> in Fiji, people were always on their phone. They, <clears throat> they possibly didn't have enough food to eat, but they had plenty of data. Um, and they're on Facebook and, and it's just, you know, it's, to me that's kind of sad because the Fijians lost that extra bit of service that they were renowned for. Um, they stopped making crafts and just bought them from China, um, pro pro probably wrapped in plastic and, and it's really, really sad. So our program over there is to actually go over and we're, we've, um, we ran a trash art competition. So it was put through all the schools and the students had to make artwork out of um, trash they found on the beach. Cool. We had some amazing entries. 
Out of that, we actually put a voting system uh, up and um, we had over 100,000 votes for the 21 mm. students who made the final. Cool. We've chosen six of those to become Ocean Ambassadors. Um, <clears throat> we're, with our friends from uh, Captain Cook Cruises Fiji, we're actually going on one of their boats for four days. We're going to take them around the islands. And during that time, um, myself and Annika, one of the other directors, we're going to educate the kids on how to teach others to look after the oceans and how important it is. Mm. We're going to do beach cleanups. We're going to do litter audits. Um, and these students will be the ambassadors for the whole of Fiji to educate the whole country. Mm. <clears throat> um, and I think they're really powerful. Uh, I think it's just going to be a successful program. It's the first time we've tried it. Wow. Um, the success of the program was awesome. So, like, um, in just the trash up, in getting awareness out, the feedback from the schools has been brilliant. At schools all across the country, like, making this a program. So, it's not hard to do. Like, to be honest, we, we sent out an email to the schools and we set up a competition um, and away we went. And I'd say the response was awesome. <clears throat> nothing, nothing is hard. It's the vision. It's having the vision and then just following through. But sometimes it's hard for people to do that. Yeah, look, I think um, it definitely takes a driven person and um, probably to the detriment of our own life. But I'm very fortunate that my wife is as passionate and crazy as I am about this sort of stuff. <laughs> it's um, a good thing. Yeah, being a dive instructor and, um, you know, she grew up in Sweden um, walking the coast with her mum, picking out rubbish. Wow. Um, so, you know, like... It, it was been meant to be you two, obviously. <laughs> yeah, it took a while for us to get together, uh, but, um, you yeah, know, eventually we did. And um, now, you know, she actually runs Ocean Crusaders in Sweden as well. Um, we're slowly growing there. Um, but... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, look, it takes dedication and a lot of time. Um, you know, Ocean Crusaders, we, we probably look bigger than we really are and the fact that um, there's only one full-time person and that's me. And that was <clears throat> literally so I could work on it 24-7 um, and unfortunately mm -hmm. I do. Like, um, I work on it way too much. You know, um, I, I keep telling myself all the time, I've got to take some time for me, I've got to take some time for me. And then I see a story of a whale that's washed up on a beach or a dolphin that's died with plastic bags in it. And I'm just like, no, I've got to do more, I've got to do more. Yeah. Um, people are out there and, you know, I mean, we've seen so many different groups like, you know, take this on and, and people are changing and there's little groups left, right and centre. And if we all combine and do our little bit, we can make a difference. But, I think it's also important to understand that individuals can play their part. <clears throat> um, we need to stop this plastic at the source, and that is not buying it in the first place. And the people who make the decisions for buying it are individuals. Um, so, you know, that, that's the first part that we need to do is like everyone can play that part. Not buying plastic in the first place, that's where it's got to start. Yeah. Educating people, there's people out there like ourselves who will do that. Um, there's programs in schools these days that will educate the kids. But, yeah, we've just got to stop it at the source. And that's a, an individual choice that only each person watching this can make. Yeah. I mean, that's why I, this is going to be spread different places. Um, <clears throat> but I belong to a church here, Unity Church, which is um, probably as non-denominational as you can get. <clears throat> What they, what they have come to is that they think the changes need to come through the churches. So they're creating all kinds of programs about plastics and about changing what they use and all of this stuff. So I, mean, I think there is slowly an awareness. I think people have gotten so overwhelmed. And what I love about our conversation is you're reducing it to each person. Each person can make a difference and that's where it starts. And I, I think the schools are incredibly important because I think kids naturally understand this stuff and it empowers them. And the, we've seen what happens when kids get empowered. They do wonderful things. Yeah, look, I've seen some kids do some amazing stuff. There's a little girl here, Molly, who's nine years old. Uh, well, she was nine years old when she started it. Yeah. She lives up in Cairns and... Um, 
she she basically saw what straws were doing to our wildlife and um, you know obviously that that image that went around last year of that straw coming out of the turtle's nose <coughs> was powerful so um, this nine-year-old started a campaign called straw no more um, and it's an Australia-wide and I believe worldwide like phenomenon of like this hashtag straw no more and and you know getting um, pubs and hotels and restaurants to put straws behind the bar was the first campaign but then to change them from plastic straws to something else yeah. there's so many different straw types out there these days but that came from a nine-year-old and the power of that campaign was brilliant um she even did a ted talk i mean oh really wow oh absolutely she's she's a fantastic young lady and i just google uh, straw no more and you'll find out all about her but oh. um yeah, yeah, Molly's a, an absolute treasure and uh, someone who will definitely be leading us into the future. One of the things, I don't, have you ever heard of a man called Prashant Lingam? He's in India. And what he has been doing with 20 um, sort of native people there was creating a company and he makes houses out of recycled plastic. And you wouldn't know it's plastic. They can make walkways, which will last 30 to 40 years out of this. So, I mean, we can clean this stuff up, but we have to do something with it. So, I mean, the, the steps I see is stop making it, then take the stuff that you clean up and do something with it so it's <clears throat> not just sitting there. So, and so we have to do this kind of in steps and all of these steps need to be addressed. But that's what he's doing there. It's, low, it's for low-income housing, but it's waterproof, fireproof, bulletproof. I mean, it's amazing stuff. Yeah, look, absolutely. Uh, recycling is a big thing in our world at the moment. However, no like recycling, recycling will only ever be effective if we purchase recycled products. Yeah. And here in Australia, there is an oversupply of recycled plastic recycled glass there's piles of this stuff really? sitting everywhere like aluminium we don't have any shortage on we, we need as much of that it's possible but the plastic um you know the company here called replast that makes street furniture and park furniture and bollards yeah. and everything out of recycled plastic they have an oversupply because well they can only build so much that they can sell yeah. so governments need to buy this stuff my ultimate vision is um there's a product called New Tech Poly, which is down in uh, country New South Wales. Um, and they can actually take commingled plastic with up to 10% contamination and melt it down and create products out of it. And this is different because the word commingled, that means all types of plastic. Mm -hmm. We're talking like plastic wrapping, we're talking hard plastics, we're even talking polystyrene can go into this machine yeah. and melt it down and they extrude it straight away. Yeah. My vision is to put this on a massive barge, going to the places where, you know, the Gulf of Carpentaria here in Australia across the top end, we're talking like uh, ghost nets. Um, they connect to each other all the way across the reef with turtles and fish and everything caught in them. And at the moment, like the, the only efficient way for the rangers and the, the native people out there to deal with it is to pull it out, put it on the land, and unfortunately they're burning it, which isn't good for the environment. <clears throat> mm. If we could put one of these units on the back of our barge, we could actually melt this product down, make building blocks like these people like in India mm -hmm. and hand them back to the Aboriginal communities. Mm -hmm. um, once we're finished across the top end of Australia, we could head up into like, you know, the most littered part of the world, which is between here and China. Um, we're talking through Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, which are amongst the top. Sorry, there was just something fell. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> the, the top waterway littering countries in the world are up through this area. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we just need the funding. And to some people, this will sound like a big number, but to other people, hopefully out there listening, they're going, no, that's not big. We're just looking for to, to buy the equipment and for the first year of operations is just 11 million US dollars. Yeah. Um, once much. we've got the equipment, governments will fund this because it'll get rid of a problem. We can look after third world countries and these places and provide them with better housing 
from plastic that's washing up on their beaches. And the key to this is we're making plastic a commodity. Mm -hmm. um, people in these places at the moment, they throw it into the waterways because the waterways will take it away. Mm -hmm. um, if we say to them, no, keep your plastics, we'll be back in three, six, 12 months. We will turn your plastic into building products, which you can sell, you can build houses with. Mm -hmm. These people won't throw this stuff away anymore. They will keep it. Right. So it's a really key program that we really keen to get off the ground ASAP and get up there and do this. Yeah. Um, because as you say, like we can turn this rubbish into good things. Yeah. Um, and we need to do that. We need to stop the, the, the purchase of virgin plastics. Yeah. Um, where there's enough plastic in the world already and that we could use that time and time again. Yeah, and I'll put you in touch with it when we get through. I will put you in touch with Prashant because they're making, it's not blocks, they're making <clears throat> siding and roofs and all kinds of things. So mm -hmm. they've developed um, different, and they're commingled plastics. So yeah, okay, fantastic. I'll put you in touch with him so maybe you guys can do something together. But he's building houses all over India. So... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that would be a great thing. This is, this is so wonderful. And I think that people, we need to hook up people. And I can be one of those hooker-uppers because I keep mm. interviewing people and I can see who's doing what and then kind of put you guys together. But he's already doing that. And um, I wanted to see if he could come to the States and set up a factory. But maybe he'll do that with you in um, Australia. Yeah, look, um, we, we want to make it a mobile plant and um, the technology's there. Yep. We just need to get the funding behind it. We, yep. As I say, everyone's got a role to play. And I'm not an expert in plastic recycling and I don't want to be. Um, I want to be, you know, I'm into boats and, and cleaning up this stuff. That's what we specialise in. Mm -hmm. um, if we can then use other people's technology to turn this into houses, what a fantastic outcome and, and yeah. it just takes somebody to turn up and say, you know what, what a fantastic vision. Here's the funding. Um, yeah. What a great thing for a company is what I'd say, but uh, yeah. I mean, that's what it has to be because it just cleaning it up is, we've got to stop producing it, got to clean it up and then figure out what to do with the stuff we clean up. I mean, it's all that stuff. Can I read, I just want to read a few things. Uh, I want people to be aware that I found on your website. Um, because it was so astounding. So it's now believed that there are 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic debris in the ocean. Of that mass, 269,000 tons float on the surface, while some 4 billion plastic microfibers per square um, kilometer liter, litter the deep sea. So shoppers worldwide are using approximately 500 billion single-use plastic bags. And this translates to about a million bags every minute across the globe. So if you join them end to end, they would circumnavigate the globe 4,200 times, so circling the whole planet. They are believed to be 46,000 pieces of plastic in every square mile of ocean. 100,000 marine creatures a year die from plastic entanglement, and these are the ones that are found Approximately 1 million seabirds also die from plastic. A plastic bag can kill numerous animals because they take so long to disintegrate. An animal that dies from the bag will decompose and the bag will be released and another animal can fall victim once again eat the same bag. <clears throat> the floods in Bangladesh in 1988 and 1998 were made more severe because plastic bags clogged the drains. The government has now banned plastic bags. And one more thing, in Ireland, they introduced a, I love this, 15 cent plastic bag tax and reduced their usage by 90% in one year. It now costs 22 cents. So those were wonderful <clears throat> things to read. It was um, good. It makes people aware of the scope of, of the issue. Um, and as you said, I think people are more aware, but that, that countries are doing something about it. And I have another question for you. How does um, climate change, how do climate change and this plastic bag epidemic interface, or do they? 
Oh, absolutely. Like our consumption of plastic is um, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is how, how important our oceans are to our very existence. Um, you know, 60 to 80 percent of our uh, oxygen comes from the ocean. Um, just as a tree transforms our carbon dioxide into um, into oxygen again, like the algaes and seagrasses in the ocean do exactly the same thing. And we all know how big the ocean is compared to land. Um, so as we keep putting our plastics into the ocean, we're basically acidifying the ocean. Uh, where as they're breaking down, um, you know, we're turning oils and all this, but also with all the extra um, production of of carbon dioxide, our our oceans are actually like heating up because the, every time. And look, I, I don't know the exact science behind it, um, but um, as this converts, it's heating our waterways um, all the time. So it's not just the sun; it's all this, all the uh, carbon dioxide transforming back into oxygen is slowly heating our oceans up. Um, the acidification of the ocean is just hurting the animals. There's a uh, the lanternfish, which actually comes up from the deep, uh, dark depths of the ocean. Yeah. Every night they come to the surface and they eat the um, algae that are actually transforming the CO2. Well, these fish are now getting to such a high level of intake of carbon that they're actually depleting in numbers. And they're the most uh, common fish in the world. Well, no one knows, no one eats them or anything like that because they're not around during the day. But um, so just the whole, it just keeps going on and on. And as I say, like, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not really good with that sort of stuff. Uh, I'm really good at pulling the stuff out. Um, <laughs> but um, just through the research that I've read, um, I just keep reading more and more things about what these plastics are doing to our ocean and uh, it's, I think it's a daily occurrence at the moment of another whale or a dolphin or, you know, something else that's died because of plastic. And it's just really heartbreaking to see that we're doing this. And then we're complaining that there's no fish in the ocean when we go fishing. Um, Gee, I wonder why. <clears throat> yeah, look, and the other thing is, you know, I mean, even the fish that we do eat, um, you know, we're consuming our own rubbish. Um, the microplastics are just coming out through the food chain. Um, and a, a recent study, uh, I think it was in America, um, is now proving that 100% of us have plastic in us uh, from what we've been eating. And, yeah, it is, it is simple. We are. We're eating our plastic in so many different ways. Um, so, yeah, it's not good. But um, we can change this and we can look after our future and, and that's the positive. Uh, I don't like to dwell on the negatives all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always like to focus on what can we do? What can we do now? And what can we do to change this in the future? And, and you know, we, we play our part of just pulling it out. Like, but there's a lot more ocean to pull rubbish out of than just what we do. Um, yeah, yeah, we travel all over Australia, but we, we can sometimes spend a day and clean up 500 metres of coastline. Um, and we will fill our boat twice in that day. So, um, yeah, it's um, not a good thing. So um, we need more people out there. And, um, yeah, look, it's, we're, we're really keen to work with as many groups as possible. And if people want to work under the Ocean Crusaders banner, like, we're very happy to do that too. That would be a wonderful thing. You talked earlier about um, you do it 24 seven and that you should take time for yourself. But as you were saying that, what I was thinking is how wonderful that you have something that lights you up, that something that is a passion for you and that you are making a difference. And that is the most powerful thing that anybody could have in their life. And I think, we are a culture, well, I'm talking about the U.S., so because that's what I know, that um, people have lost their way in so many areas, but for them to find something like this or to work with you or organizations that are doing the kinds of things that you're doing, that would empower people so much, and that would give them a place, if you know what I mean. Well, look, and, and everyone, as I say, like the world's about goals. Um, uh, and, you know, if you, oh, I wrote a book once called Dare to Dream after I sailed around Australia. 
Mm. Um, and it literally is about setting goals and chasing them. And I've done this all my life. You know, I used to play like quite competitive cricket. Um, and then I, you know, was windsurfing at, at a you know fairly high level. Um, and I've even sailed at a high level. Like, you know, I've done the Sydney to Hobart. So, you know, and yeah. um, whilst I haven't done a Volvo Ocean Race or America's Cup, um, I've kind of found my calling and, and it came through my, my journey and everyone's got their own journey and, and you can share that. But, you know, for me, like the turtles, like for anyone who has never swum with a turtle, put it on your bucket list. Um, as you're swimming along with these, amazing creatures they are so calm in the water and to swim along the you know in the great barrier reef like you know one of the seven wonders of the world like with these magnificent creatures like you can't help but want to protect them um and you know we've seen recently like you know videos come up of turtles being released from nets and and all this and they they go viral so quickly because people are like wow look at this wouldn't that be awesome and you know, there's part of me that says, gee, I'd love a video like that. But there's also part of me that says, I hope I never see an animal in distress like that ever again. Yeah. Um, you know, seeing the eight that I've had, like, and unfortunately I was too late on all of them. Um, that you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. But they, I'll always go back to that, that moment of that turtle. Like, yeah, there was two others that had died because of plastic and, you know, a couple others that actually died because of um, crab pots where they'd um, put the nets in the water and the, the turtles had gone in. Um, so they died because of us and um, I can't deal with it. Like, you know, I had to do something and that passion will always drive Ocean Crusaders. And as I say, every time I see another video on the, the internet of another whale dying and all that, like, it just drives me again, just going, okay, I've got to get back out there. And... It's quite amusing because I probably don't pick up much rubbish um, personally, Mm -hmm. Um, but I facilitate others to do it. And that has become my role. I used to love picking it up myself and being out there on the boats, but it's as Ocean Crusaders continues to grow and we need to continue getting funding, it really is becoming a role of mine to facilitate others. And we've got some fantastic volunteers out there um, particularly one guy up on the, in Noosa, which is just north of Brisbane here. Um, I've never seen someone so passionate about pulling rubbish out. And as I say, he hasn't got a smile on his face until he's waist deep in mangrove mud. Um, before that, he's just, oh, you know. Oh, yeah. But he pulls out tons personally and, and he's lucky to be like semi-retired and gets to do it as often as he likes. And... When I say often, I'm talking three, four times a week, he's out there wow. picking up rubbish. Wow. Um, so, you know, he's got a passion for it and he's got a passion for Ocean Crusaders, which is even better. Um, but we've been able to facilitate him. And um, on the weekend, we're at Morton Island, the third biggest sand bank in the world, or sand island in the world. And um, you know, we pulled like nearly two ton of plastic debris off the beach. And when you're talking plastics, we're talking like over like something like 40,000 pieces of plastic off a beach um, in a weekend. Um, and he was a huge part of that. Wow. But every time someone comes to our events, they seem to get that passion. Um, sure. And they just want to come to another event and they start doing it themselves. And I start getting photos of people on their kayaks and oh. the loads of rubbish they're pulling out. So it's just we've just got to facilitate the people to do it and and make it cool like this trash tag has made it cool to pick up rubbish um and there's photos everywhere of people doing that it's awesome to see from our point of just going yeah we've we're kind of helping with the issue Uh, i'm not saying we're leading it or anything like that but um you know we're, we're helping facilitate people and and that's a key goal for anyone who wants to do this facilitate others to help that's so wonderful. And you talked a little bit about your role is different now. Your role is going to keep changing. I mean, I work with entrepreneurs a lot. I watch that when it, when it was just you or you and a couple of other people, that's one thing. But you're going to have to be the goodwill ambassador, the fundraiser, all that stuff. So your role is going to keep changing. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's probably like um, running the charity is probably one of my toughest things because I am an organizer and a doer 
Um, I'm not so much, uh, as I like to say, like, you know, um, shaking hands, kissing babies. Um, <laughs> I'm not very good at putting a suit on. In fact, I don't even own a suit. So, um, you know, going and talking to the politicians and yeah. that sort of thing, I, I really struggle with. But we've been really fortunate enough that we've been able to pull into the fold a couple of people who are good at that. Um, and, and they've been helping us heaps. And, and I guess it's, they've seen what we do mm -hmm. um, and they want to help. And I know my limitations. Um, I know that you know, writing those huge grant proposals to get millions of dollars is not my forte. Mm -hmm. I can put the passion into it. I can organize the program to buy this boat um, and get that boat out in the water. And I've got some amazing people who help me do that. But I really struggle in, I guess, that refinement um, of the proposals to get the big money and, and doing that book where I, it frustrates me like to do all of this you know, background work. Um, I just want to get out there and clean. Yeah. Um, but so. I think people see your passion. I mean, that that's a deciding factor. And, and passion moves people to see through your eyes. So that still is a role that you play. You might not be writing the grants and you might not do the initial contact, but when people mm. see your passion, that, and you don't have to have a suit for that. No, and, um, you know, that's the key to it is that we've been able to get these people involved and, and slowly, like, we're building those relationships. Obviously, they've got full-time work, so they can't do it all the time. Uh, and the charities, any normal charity always struggles for money to do what they really want to do. Um, so it's a balance between, like, you know, putting someone on, getting enough funding to cover them. And I don't like having huge overheads. Like, I'm... Sure. Sitting in my office at the moment, which just happens to be our house. Mm -hmm. um, we have a workshop, which is in the backyard of a friend's place because um, you know, we put shipping containers there to put our stuff together. We, we don't want to put massive overheads because we want to see the money go to cleaning up and, and running our boats and, and manning our craft of people actually out there cleaning up. Yeah. Um, you know, we do a large percentage of our, our money does go to wages for crew on boats because to enable us to do it, we can't always have volunteers. Sure. And our social enterprise side of the business is, as I say, we go to places that we possibly can't even take the community to because of the hazards involved. Yeah. And so the only way to get into those places is really to have our own core team. And, I can't ask people to volunteer all the time. Like people have jobs and so we do have to pay wages. Sure. Um, so that's why there are costs. And um, I do get frustrated occasionally when people go, oh, you're a charity. Like, why do you need to charge for this? And it's like, well, oh, excuse me. <laughs> sorry, but our boats don't run on air. Um, you know, we've got a $120,000 landing barge. Um, it uses fuel, it has insurance. Like we paid nearly $20,000 a year in insurances to protect yeah. our our crew, our community, all of our equipment and all of that. So, you know, we need these running costs. Um, so, you know, we're always pushing um, and it's always a fine balance. Um, but, you know, if at the end of the day, if we save one or two turtles, um, it's all worth it to me. Um, I'm sure we're doing more than that. And the bird life that we pull stuff out, it's, we're just always going to keep pushing. Um, and that's what we do. And, we push with a passion and we know people are starting to see this. Councils are starting to wake up. Governments are starting to wake up. And every time I see that someone has banned this or banned that, it brings a smile to my face because it's happening. We're yeah. moving. It's positive and that's a great thing. And you're a big part of it. That's the other piece. I mean, you need to let that come in too. That keeps you going. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I do occasionally look back and just go, wow, we did that. Um, you yeah. know, we played a part in that. And, you know, the, the great thing about this trash tag at the moment is that you see the before and after. Yeah. And a lot of the times I don't get a chance to go back and see it afterwards. Um, you know, I, I see you before all the time. Yeah. Um, and then occasionally, I, you know, we, we took it on one of the recent trips, the before and after, and I was just like, yeah, how good is that? That's what we do. Um, and knowing that, you know, later on, a, 
a bird or a, you know a crab or something's going to wander through that area and go wow look at this it's like natural again <laughs> um that's cool like you know love that you got to think of that yeah and i think people don't understand that all the animals that are on this planet and that includes includes the creepy crawlies as the native americans call them and so forth they're, they all provide a function and sometimes people don't understand if we get rid of a certain animal that kind of destroys the balance in nature so it's not just mm -hmm. us it's oh, absolutely definitely cre other creatures too they're very very important because they fulfill something that we don't and they provide a balance which we don't so yeah, absolutely and the oceans the, the order of life in the oceans is really critical to our oxygen supply. And a lot of people don't realize that that one creature that so many people are scared of, the shark, mm -hmm. is really key to the existence of us on this planet. And if we keep killing our sharks off, who are the rulers of the ocean, like they go around and they are the big boss, they make the big decisions. If we take all the sharks out, we could take out all the algae eating fish of the future because like, you know, sharks control that at the moment. They they create that balance. Yeah. If that balance is upset and all of a sudden all our algae and, and seagrasses are eaten, then, you know, that's our oxygen supply gone. So, you know, it, as you say, the, the order of life and humans are part of that. We are not the ultimate rulers of this place. Absolutely. We are part of this world. And that's my real vision of like, we must coexist with every other creature in this world. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're not, we, we can't be seen to be going, you know what, sharks, like, we don't like them because they eat us when we go into their playground. Well, mm -hmm. you know Bingo. what? Their playground. It, it, if a fish jumps out of the water and lands on your barbecue, um, there's not too many people who are going to go, oh, no, no, I'll throw you back. And sharks do that every day when we jump into their, their world. Um, in at dinner time, at dawn and dusk, when the surfers go out looking like their favourite food, they just think, oh, wow, look at this, on a, on a silver platter. Um, they realise later that we're not very tasty and spit us back out. But, um, you know, it's, um, but then all of a sudden we want to kill all the sharks. Um, and, and let's face it, sharks kill less people than, than bees and, and vending machines and, and all sorts of things. Uh, yeah. Should we cull cars because they kill people? Uh, you know. Yeah, it, it's an interesting story, but we love sharks. Uh, if you ever get to dive with a shark and see them in their beauty, like especially over in the Galapagos, like wow. it's unbelievable. They are a real amazing creature. Wow. Thank you for giving me new eyes so I can see differently. I appreciate that. So what, what's your goal for Ocean Crusaders for the rest of this year and going into 2020? Um, looking at the end of this year, uh, certainly we're expanding up and down through Australia. Um, we have been Brisbane based for quite some time and last year we went into Victoria. Um, this year we're moving into Sydney. Um, we've got our first event in May in Sydney um, and we have a huge plan for that. Um, we also have a, um, an event planned for Western Australia. So we're covering Australia off because I do want to nail Australia like down perfectly. Um, we've obviously got our Fiji Ocean Ambassador program going on uh, next week. Wow. Um, so we'd love to see Fiji start to grow. Um, but some other goals, like we went, we were fortunate enough last year to go sailing in Phuket. And we're actually starting to work with Sunsail now to start what we can hopefully, I, I don't even know what we're going to call it, whether it's called a trash fertilla or something like mm -hmm. that. But creating flotillas that go around in these stunning places where all their fleets are. Um, we will go around, we'll find a beautiful beach, unfortunately in Phuket through the PP Islands, like they're all trashed with rubbish. Wow. If we turn up, spend an hour cleaning it, then we can spend the rest of the day enjoying it. Um, so we're going to start that program. Um, but I guess for the rest, the end of the year, my ultimate goal, um, being a sailor is the Sydney to Hobart yacht race. Um, it's in its 75th edition this year, and yeah. we were fortunate enough last year, uh, Stacey Jackson, who was on the Volvo Ocean Race, so a lot of sailors there in Newport uh, would yeah. know Stacey. Um, Stacey is a, 
uh, are local to us, and I've known Stacey for quite some time. And through the, they last year's Sydney to Hobart ran a program um, called Ocean Respect Racing, which was sponsored by Eleventh Hour Racing um, through the Ocean Foundation. Um, they had an all-female professional team do the race. Wow. Um, and they came second overall. And they created so much awareness for, like, looking after our oceans. And we're hoping they're going again. And we want to go with them on our own boat um, to promote it. And we have a vision of having a Sydney Harbour cleanup in the lead-up and a Derwent River cleanup afterwards so that we can bookend the race. Um, with some major events. Um, so that's what we'd like to do in the future. Obviously, our big landing barge to, to head up and, and all through the Pacific. I've been to places in the Pacific where it takes four days to find someone, but two seconds to find plastic rubbish. Wow. Um, so, you know, we need to get out there. We need to get this stuff out. So, yeah, our big landing barge, Several of them would be awesome, but we need to get the first one to prove concept. And I think the concept's easy to prove. It's just a matter of getting it going. Yeah. I mean, it, sounds, it sounds so wonderful. And I like all these new things that you're doing. It's like you are expanding out into the world more and more and more. So once, once you get all of Australia, then we can get you maybe here and maybe in some <laughs> other countries as well. You never know. Oh, I would think that there's going to be... Like other people like me, um, I don't think I need to come to America because I think there's lots of groups happening already in America. And, and who knows, someone listening to this might go, I can do that. That's not that hard. And to be honest, it's not that hard. It's just doing it with a passion. The hardest part about this job is putting food on the table. Like, and, yeah. and that is a priority, apparently. Um, <laughs> but, um, sure. you know... I'd love to eat rice all day and save a turtle rather than go out for a super expensive meal. That's just me. But there's people everywhere and, and inspiring others to do what we're doing. As I say, I am only too happy that if someone listening to this, like we've already have a lady in Florida who pushes Ocean Crusaders, but if someone up in Newport wants to run a Newport version of Ocean Crusaders, I, straight to the website, Send an email to us. Let's get it happening. Um, and that's what it is. Proactive. Let's make it happen. We're right now in Charleston, South Carolina, which, again, um, is, is pretty much waterways. People sail here. Not as much as Newport. It's not a race town so much. But there's a lot of awareness here. So hopefully. And we have Joe Cunningham, who just um, got into Congress, who is uh, protecting our, our waterfront. So you never know. You never know, and hopefully this will uh, inspire some people. That's the whole point of doing this. And I will definitely put you in touch with Prashant. And um, there's somebody else I have in mind that I want to put you in touch with. So um, I will be emailing you and Wonderful. following up. And I am delighted. And it just it does my heart good to know what you're doing. And it just gives everybody hope to see this. So this is so wonderful. Ian, thank you so very, very much for what you're doing and for sharing that with us. I so appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Cheers. So thank you for being here with us and the founder of Ocean Crusaders. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. And my wish is that Ian has inspired you and as all of our interviewees inspire you to get out there and do what you can do because one person can make a huge difference and you can make a better world for everybody. So this is your host, Diane J. Shaver for Transformations, Entering People, Changing Our World. And join us in two weeks when I'm going to be interviewing someone else who's doing something to make a better world for all of us. And I will see you then. We hope that you enjoyed the show. To hear more of these wonderful shows on selfdiscoverymedia.com, just look up our podcast genre list. You will see many shows archives there ready for listening. Don't forget to share these wonderful shows. And if you wish to be a guest or host, or you have an organization that needs to be highlighted, contact us at info at selfdiscoverymedia.com. Bye for now.